Hey guys, welcome to lecture number six, which is prevening calf management. We already talked about uh, colostrum feeding and how to feed colostrum and milk, right? So we um, uh, talked about tubing a calf. We talked about different routes of colostrum administration, right? Uh, or milk bottle feeding, bucket feeding. Uh, suckling the mother and one of the techniques we talked about was tubing a calf or you know insert via a calf feeder stomach tube so i i won't go into details on this uh, youtube video you, you can watch this on youtube see that that's the link right um and this is about 10 minutes long right so i, I urge you to watch this okay so he doesn't exactly follow the technical steps we talked about right but Nevertheless, it's important for you to see this, right? Okay, and um, right. So let's let's skip that, right? This I will go through. Now we we said uh, uh, bottle feeding is critical, especially at the beginning, right? And uh, now, what what do you think? Do you think it's recommended to keep on feeding via bottle? the whole two months or whatever during the preweaning period or do you think we should shift to the bucket from the bottle right so bottle feeding is fine uh, but the problem is bottle feeding is more cumbersome cleaning disinfecting bottles would be more difficult and in addition um, um, you know the, you have to have labor right so labor not only for cleaning the bottles but also for feeding the calves so whereas if you can uh, teach uh, if you can transition from bottle to bucket right uh, then that will be a lot easier you don't have to feed the uh, have a human labor to feed the calf and also cleaning is also a lot more easier you know? cleaning the bottle cleaning the teeth right mostly you have to ideally you have to clean with hot water and soap right it's more difficult and labor intensive right and it's not necessary once the calf uh, used gets used to the bucket okay so what do you think because we talked about uh, we talked about um, uh, the disadvantages of bucket feeding right which is you know it doesn't uh, it the esophageal group closure is not as efficient with the bucket compared to the bottle so what happens then what do you think uh, uh, is it going to interfere with the use of a give group closure and in that case is the bucket not recommended what do you think but you see we don't transition the calves to the bottle right at the beginning uh, we can do that for uh, we can do the bottle for the first couple of weeks and by when we do the first couple of weeks right the calf starts this conditional reflex that we talked about and then when it gets conditioned the esophageal groove closure will take place when the calf observes the farmer preparing milk utensils bottles feeding other calves etc etc and on if you're on time you know around that time the calf expects milk right so when esophageal groove closure, closure takes place is conditioned properly you can use the bucket because regardless of whether, whether the calf drinks from the bucket or the bottle uh, esophageal groove closure will take place properly right? so typically uh, in large farms they transition at around 10 days two weeks three weeks depending on the farm right Okay, I hope that is clear. So let's um, look, look at watch this video. But before we wa watch the video, what do you think? Huh? Do you think it's an easy process? Uh, in let's say on the 14th day, instead of the bottle, you just put the milk into the bucket, and is the calf going to drink out of the bucket just like that? Let's let's watch this video and see. Yeah. So I, I you may not get the sounds of this. So I, I urge you to uh, watch this on this YouTube. Uh, video uh, that's the link
bucket, uh, Belgian blues that we've uh, put in the pens. For some reason, both of these decided they didn't want to suck their mums, which is unusual. Um, makes it difficult for us because we've got to try and get them to drink uh, milk from the bucket. The one on the right, you see? Now, the first calf, I don't know if you observed, the first calf had no problem. It kept on drinking, right? Uh, he just added the milk to the bucket. So I, I presume that's because uh it's an older calf it looked a little larger right so it it already knows how to drink from the bucket but look at this calf it just smelled the milk right uh it didn't drink why is that see drinking out of a bucket is not a natural physiological movement or process for a calf whereas suckling the bottle is natural because suckling the bottle is almost as same as suckling the mother's teeth right um, so that that the vacuum action that that's that's not unnatural whereas this is unnatural right so you can't just add what uh, milk to a bucket and blame the calf if it doesn't drink milk right so you have to teach the calf how to drink from a bucket okay so i i doubt uh, you know a lot of people uh, do this in sri lanka uh, so we need to watch the larger calf throws the water away adds milk see okay that one starts drinking milk immediately okay but this guy a couple of uh, Belgian blues that we've uh, put in the pens for some reason both of these decided they didn't want to suck their mums which is unusual, um, makes it difficult for us because we've got to try and get them to drink uh, milk from the bucket. The one on the left here, you can see there, it's, it's actually doing that drink from the bucket now. Um, and it's not too bad. And this one on the right, I only put it in here yesterday. Um, it doesn't actually really know how to drink milk from the bucket yet, so I've got to try and teach it. And the hardest bit with this one is getting the confidence of the car to come to the bucket. Coming. So what I'll probably do? So you get them stuck on my fingers first of all. This is really the key to getting a calf trained from the bucket. See, Look, see that's a natural movement for the calf. Wait. See, she's sucking my fingers like replicating the seat. Come on, calf. I hope you can hear this voice. Um, I have to narrate. Come. Now, if I can put his head down in the bucket. I get a taste of the milk and my fingers at the same time. And what I'm doing then is I slowly withdraw. I've got two fingers in this mouth. Take one finger away. Right, taking that other finger away slowly. And he's not quite sure now, look. But he's going to look for the fingers now in the, in the milk, I expect. Or he's looking for the fingers around me. So it's kind of a case of getting them used to drinking from the bucket and trying to get them out of sucking my fingers now eventually they'll get so hungry they'll they'll actually go straight for the milk see i've got one finger in his mouth a couple of times like that normally they, now what he'll do is he'll mess around um, okay i i hope you uh, saw that right um, so that that's the method to do it but i want you to watch the whole uh, video on youtube i'm not going to spend uh, time on that uh, here Right, so basically you have to get the calf to suckle one or two of your fingers right mm -hmm. so that will be a natural motion for the suckling motion for the calf so it will suck on your fingers and right? then you bring the draw the calf towards the milk right um, and uh, you know get the while the calf suckles your fingers calf will uh, the milk will automatically go into the mouth and then the calf will learn to eventually uh, drink from the bucket right it will learn that motion with the tongue right so that that is that is how you do it right uh, so it's, it's not easy at the beginning right but once you train the calf uh, then it's it's easy it will just drink off the bucket right okay so now what do you do uh, if the mother has you know poor quality colostrum or it doesn't have any colostrum right now certain examples like you know might be the mother died during parturition right 
or the mother um, had a preterm calf, right? So let's say the calf was supposed to come out at 280 days, but the calf came out at 260 days of gestation. And then, you know, the mother may not have colostrum yet, right? Because there was 20 more days to go. Might have a little bit, but not sufficient. Then what do you do? Uh, so then what we can do is we can give something called a um, colostrum replacer, right? So this says first milk calf colostrum powder, right? So um, what, what can, so in, in, let's say in Sri Lanka, let's say you're a farm, uh, you're a farm manager, the Ambavilla farm, right? Uh, there is no cholesterol, a ca 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 uh, calf doesn't have cholesterol for some reason. What do you do? You don't have this commercial preparation either. Can you make cholesterol? Right? You can, right? You can make cholesterol, something like three cups of milk, uh, one beaten egg, some kind of oil to get some fat, sugar to get the energy, right? Egg for the protein and so on. But this lacks something. What does it lack? It lacks immunoglobulins, right? So remember, colostrum. We talked about uh, we talked about this. Immunoglobulins, immunity is one of the major functions of feeding colostrum. Not just the nutrition, right? So you can give the nutrition, you can give the hydration, but you cannot give the IgG by doing this right so that's why there are commercial preparations for that right you we don't have that in sri lanka uh, but you know uh, in the western world there is colostrum to be artificial colostrum to be purchased right so you look at the ingredients here uh, crude protein 50 percent right so what i want to show you is this one see bovine serum globulin bovine serum globulin so that's igg globulin right globulin protein 27 percent or 150 grams remember we talked about grams right so typically if you feed 100 grams right about 35 of that gets absorbed right uh, 35 grams right so then um, if you feed within the first two hours and for a calf having um, 3.5 liters of blood volume, uh, that gives uh, 10 grams per liter or 10 milligrams per ml, right? Whereas this has 150 grams. So even for a larger calf, uh, it will give more than 10 grams per liter in its blood, right? So this is uh, artificial colostrum. Or colostrum replacer right so now this has just all immunoglobulins right from bovine serum globulin whatever was present in the mother's blood right so typically you'll have to where can you get this from bovine serum globulin where can you get it from you have to get from the blood of an adult right so you'll have to collect blood from slaughterhouses right so typically in slaughterhouses you would have heard in public health and so on uh, that there's something called the blood meal right so they collect the blood and use it for it's highly nutritious right it use it for feeding uh, preparing uh, animal feed right so you can get the blood from uh, there and separate it and take the uh, globulin fraction out and use it for this kind of thing so in ad in addition to that you can also get preparations specifically with <coughs> i'm sorry the type of uh, immunoglobulins you want like e coli antibody right or coronavirus antibody right so you do that you don't do that routinely uh, if if you know your farm farm has a e coli problem or a coronavirus diarrhea problem right then you get this so this won't be necessarily a, a replacer but it will most likely be a supplement so think about the difference between supplement versus replacer right so you need to understand um, supplement 
and replacer are two different things right as per the meaning english meaning a uh, replacer is you know you give it you replace maternal colostrum altogether right say you know that you couldn't get any colostrum at all right whereas supplement to replace or supplement colostrum right so for example look, look at the difference of the number of grams 115 here and half that amount here right so why would you want to give uh, a supplement rather than a replacer mm -hmm. say for example um, you know it was poor quality colostrum right here it was lack of colostrum here it was poor quality colostrum calf drank you couldn't make the calf drink all three liters three or four liters instead you had to it only drank one liter and you were not happy with the amount of immunoglobulins that would have the calf would have up, taken up and so therefore you decide to uh, give supplement right or as you know you have in a farm there are problems uh, like um, let's say there's so so, so much um, joint ill navel ill diarrhea pneumonia you have all those so you decide to give a supplement even if the calf drank all three liters of cholesterol right so those are the examples where you will use supplement right uh, instead of replacer right um, so right now in sri lanka there is no supplement or replacer cholesterol replacer locally available locally available or locally produced so if anybody is interested in uh, you know producing something like this uh, you have a great potential right and uh, this is something actually you can even do as a project as a student project as a uh, master's project or undergraduate project right and um, you know uh, produce a commercially viable supplement right? so it's it's doable a lot of potential in sri lanka okay so like there are colostrum replacers there are also milk replacers right um, so this particular sachet or packet i'm showing happens to be a medicated milk replacer right so it has uh, in addition to all the nutrients of you know milk it also has um, you know oxytetracycline and um uh, neomycin sulfate right which are antibiotics so they say uh, based on the calf weight uh, these in pounds not kilos mm -hmm. so 75 pounds is something like you know 35 kilos right uh, based on the weight right this is this is the amount of oxytetracycline or neomycin the calf has to have right so de depending on um, the calf weight you can mix it in the milk right uh, or feed right right so that was some prerequisite to what we talked about last week right so now let's take the proper lecture for today right and uh, i'm sorry not, not prerequisite some points that i missed uh, to cover during last week right lecture five completion okay so um uh, right so now with preweaning calf management you know because milk feeding is just one aspect uh, preweaning calf management what are the main goals of preweaning calf management right so obviously you know uh, nutrition is one goal right but why do why does the calf need the nutrition for right for growth right so we talk about basically three goals of preweaning management right so the first is to produce a healthy calf right so we talked about all this colostrum uh, medicated milk replacers hygienic environments all that to produce a healthy calf right and then uh, there's no point of the calf being healthy if it's growth retarded or growth stunted calf right so we want a healthy calf but at the same time also a well-grown calf right and there, there is so usually in sri lanka at least when people talk about pre-weaning management this is what they care about producing a healthy and well-grown calf but there is a important third goal uh, which automatically happens if you do the management properly but it you can optimize it if you pay 
special attention to it. What is that? Hmm? That is related to the rumen, right? So basically, as you know, cattle are ruminants. Uh, we call them ruminants because they have a different um, stomach compared to a monogastric animal, right? A rumen instead of a monogastric stomach. But um, calves uh, act as monogastric animals because their rumen is not developed yet. The main functional component of the complex stomach of the calves is the abomasum, which is the equivalent of the monogastric stomach. And so one of our main goals should be to transition the monogastric calf into a ruminant, right? Um, so those are the three major goals. If you don't achieve those three goals with poor management, you will obviously have the poor health and, uh, you know, like diarrhea, pneumonia, never will joint till, and then you will also have poor growth. Right. So initially poor growth and poor feed conversion ratio, which eventually end up in poor reproductive parameters as well. Uh, so typically we say our goal is to get the first service done at 15 months. You know, that can get pushed to 20 months or even beyond two years. Our goal is to get the first calf at 24 months right, with poor calf management practices. This can get pushed to two and a half years or even further, right? And then all of these will also affect the first lactation yield, uh, lifetime milk yield, etc., etc., etc. Right? So that's why it's important to get um, proper management practices going on so that you can avoid these short term and long term adverse effects right right so you see you have to um, be aware right now these are in dairy farming situations you know we are not talking about individual calf management right although we see that a lot in sri lanka with the small and medium scale dairy farming you know your your goal is usually uh, to manage a herd right so when you have a herd when you have 100 calves or when you have 500 calves right it's impossible to keep uh, disease away completely it's impossible to keep zero morbidity and mortality rates right so up to a certain extent, uh, morbidity and mortality has to be tolerated, right? So you can have as much as 25% animals getting sick, right? And in a certain age category, that's kind of expect not expected, but that's kind of, uh, you know, forgiven, uh, tolerable. But if it goes beyond that, then uh, it becomes unacceptable, right? So we talk about different morbidity and mort morbidity rates for diarrhea and pneumonia, right? For so scavers is diarrhea, calf diarrhea, right? So um, so within the first two months, right, to have twenty five percent calves affected from diarrhea is not unusual right um, so up to 25 so not all of them will be sick at the same time the 25 percent but uh, during the course from one day to 60 days uh, on and off about 25 percent calves to get affected with diarrhea uh, is is tolerable right that happens but if you have 40 50 60 percent animals getting diarrhea then there is definitely a management problem right so even if you are getting 25 percent diarrhea that, that still means something is wrong with the management however still not no reason to panic because they are not going to die right um, and then but after two months you shouldn't have more than two percent diarrhea and from two months to um, i'm sorry so from here up to two months here from two to four months 
and from four to six months you shouldn't have more than one percent diarrhea right so the numbers here would be 25 percent uh two percent and one percent right so but the pattern is slightly different for pneumonia right so here within the first two months we said up to 25 percent diarrhea but usually for pneumonia within the first 10 60 days or two months you don't expect to see more than 10 percent right so more than 10 percent would be a problem right so here the second to fourth months diarrhea dramatically drops from 25 percent to two percent but here it increases from 10 percent to 15 percent right so why is that why do you think the reason for what do you think the reason for that is right so it's actually to do actually to do with immunity again right uh, so we'll talk about that on a different slide but uh, you know i talked about passive immunity and uh, active immunity right so right around two months um, or maybe sometimes some it depends on the book you look at right some books say around eight weeks some books say around four weeks around six weeks uh, depending on different studies and different textbooks uh, but but what's important to understand is at certain at a certain point passive immunity drops the passive immunity the calf gets from the colostrum it's not going to last forever right that drops and therefore the calf has to develop uh, active immunity gradually unfortunately there is a window between these two where where the, the level of immunity is very poor where it has neither active immunity nor passive immunity right um, so during that phase um, the pneumonia increases huh? so that, that's that's what's shown here between two to four months that's why it increases from 10 percent to 15 percent right? so during this period uh, there is neither i mean not zero but passive immunity goes down active immunity is still going up but hasn't come up to the immunity level right and then uh, after four months right uh, from four to six months it should be less than two percent right so here it's 25 to 2 to 1 here 10 15 2 percent now those are the tolerable or acceptable numbers but anything beyond that is unacceptable right so if you have um, okay so this is about mortality right so that's next slide right um so i think i showed this to you earlier also when we were doing a colostrum feeding uh, you see here that mortality rates see survival so the reverse would be mortality so that would be zero mortality that would be 10 percent mortality right um, so this is directly related to the serum color uh, antibody levels in calves right so higher colost antibody levels lower mortality lower colostrum levels higher mortality or lower survival right eight percent asset percent mortality here two percent four percent mortality here right so even with so that, that's like i said earlier you know you are not going to get zero mortality uh, there will be the odd, odd calf um that dies uh, sometimes not because of poor management practices but just that the calf is you know not fit survival of the fittest right so some kind of uh, uh, abnormality you know doesn't have to be a huge birth defect but could be you know physiologically you know not fit enough right uh, or it could be management poor management uh, so regardless right so basically the fundamental you need to understand is we need to give more colostrum more igg better survival uh, lower mortality right so uh, within the first two months right uh, basically um, up to five percent mortality can be accepted. you ideally want it to be 
even less than 5%, uh, preferably 1 or 2%, but it's not unusual to get uh, up to 5% mortality, right? Uh, we have visited certain large farms in Sri Lanka where they have up to 15-20% 20, mortality. Uh, these are good farms I'm talking about. Intensive or semi-intensive farms, upcountry farms, private farms, right? So that's something wrong, something wrong somewhere. Right, so uh, four hours to 60 days of age, right, two months. And the next two months, 60 to 120 days, you know, it should not be more than 2%. And from four to six months, it should not be more than 1%, right? So this would be highly dependent on the farm management, uh, quality and quantity of colostrum, etc. right? Um, so two things I want to say, one is that, you know, the proper pronunciation of the word mortality. Uh, I, I hear even professors saying motility. Uh, motility is what you see in sperms, right? Motility or motility, right? That's not this. This is mortality, death rate, right? Morbidity, sick, sick rate, right? So this is death rate. Um, so usually in dairy or any animal production system, dairy, poultry, uh, goat, uh, they are not pet animals, right? So usually if you see morbidity or mortality, that usually reflects poor management, right? So in, in uh, animal production system, we usually say disease is a result of poor management, right? So if you have bad numbers here or bad numbers for diarrhea or pneumonia, uh, you just don't think about antibiotics or you know uh, stuff right you have to think about uh, management failure and fixing those management failures right so don't forget that it's not pet animals right <clears throat> right so we talked about three main diseases of calves right the first one we talked about was never lil uh, going on to become joint ill and the two other major uh, calf diseases are uh, neonatal diarrhea which is also called calf scars and pneumonia right um, so uh, you know you don't have to memorize these different um, uh, organisms that cause diarrhea different uh, during different periods of time right but the reason why you need to know this is to be able to administer the correct treatment, right? So let's say uh, typically during five to seven days, uh, so you have either uh, um, coronavirus, rotavirus, or cryptosporidium, uh, which is a protozoa, right? So th is there any point giving antibiotics? No, right. So if the diarrhea is after five days, um, you know, no, no point giving uh, bacteria, uh, bacterial treatment. Of course, here, you know, if it's salmonella, then it's a you know different thing, right? Um, so this is the reason you need to know. Uh, if it's first three days, then it's definitely bacterial, right? But let's say three and uh, four, fourth day, uh, unlikely to be a bacterial disease of course you know you you don't get exact definitions like this right but usually like i said you know this is not a single animal that we are talking about we are talking about a herd of calves right 100 calves 200 calves and out of these 200 calves if you always see diarrhea within the first three days okay this is most likely e coli you can do a fecal sample culture and see if you can get a uh, pure um, uh, culture of e coli right uh, or you do and then you you know this is um, uh, e coli diarrhea right but it's not that straightforward right because anyway there's going to be fecal diarrhea uh, i mean fecal e coli that are common cells in the gut right so therefore you have to look for uh, you know specific types uh, pathogenic types right and all that right so this is this is very complicated right that, that's why we can't you know specifically do all these uh, culture and abst antibiotic sensitivity testing and all that so that's why you have to sometimes just go by 
you know tentative treatment tentative diagnosis based on the epidemiology right so which is here the age at which you which the calves get the diarrhea right um, right so this is why you need to know this huh? if it's uh, at three weeks uh, uh, you know no point giving uh, antibiotics right three weeks uh, it's most likely one of these three uh, protozoa right so right. so anyway you have to have an idea so if, if at a viva or exam i ask you okay a calf uh, herd of calves is having diarrhea at three weeks but what are the most likely causes and you say rotavirus and coronavirus you know wrong answer you don't get any marks right so you you need to have a rough idea about when calves will get these different organisms right so now the uh, so something important for you to understand is right uh, now uh, like i said earlier you know you know it's not just a matter of antibiotics when you treat i have seen many veterinarians uh, not only in um, calves and dogs right so they just give the antibiotic they disregard the whole syndrome where you know calf has had a lot of diarrhea and has lost a lot of water and therefore may be dehydrated right so in which case you might need to give uh, electrolyte or fluid replacement now, if it's only a mild dehydration iv fluids is not necessary but if it's moderate to severe dehydration iv fluids might be important right um, so this is why you need to know this by so we do something called the skin tent uh, test right skin tenting you can look it up on the internet how you do it you already some of you may already know it uh, see, seen it done in uh, dogs and puppies right uh, so based on the skin tent uh, duration you can estimate the level of dehydration and accordingly you need to think of uh, you know oral uh, fluid therapy right based on the level of dehydration okay so that that's that's why this is important right so a uh, lot of people like i said they would only think about antimicrobials right no but you need to replace fluid and or electrolyte as necessary right uh, so po is per os oral route iv intravenous which all, all of you know right so so this would be treatment right so there's no point giving treatment only because like i said usually disease indicates a poor management practice right so you have to go and correct the management practice which might be colostrum feeding right poor colostrum feeding or which might be heat stress cold stress chilly wind unhygienic housing right poor manure management etc etc so you have to not only treat the acute cases but also address the poor management practices and fix all of those to prevent recurrence in the future right otherwise uh, these will go on i, I think I've, i must have told you this example when i was doing um, joint till so once a farmer a farm manager you know from a university farm not our farm agriculture farm uh, came and told me uh, you know doctor we have this recurrent problem of joint till we've been giving uh, streptomycin which worked wonderfully well in the past but now they have become resistant to streptomycin so please give me a different antibiotic right so give, is giving a different antibiotic the solution no it's not right so he he admits that he has a recurrent problem of joint tail which indicates that there is a poor management practice right which might be poor colostrum feeding which might be poor sanitation which might be poor navel management right so you have to fix those of course you give antibiotics to treat the current case but you know preventing this in the future is a major goal of the veterinarian and the farm management system okay so don't forget any of these and in large farms if you really can't get rid of a certain problem let's say you have recurrent e coli diarrhea you have recurrent 
corona rota virus uh, you do everything possible but for some reason you can't get rid of it and then you might even consider vaccination of the dam or even the newborn uh, more than the, for these early ones five to seven days max vaccinating the newborn won't do any good because typically uh, it takes around two weeks for immunity to develop after uh, vaccination uh, so vaccinating the dam and getting high levels of antibody in the colostrum uh, might be a good strategy uh, or else you supplement uh, antibodies and so on right okay right so that's about diarrhea and now we want to talk about pneumonia right so here again you see the the pathogenic organisms it could be viral related it could be bacterial it could be mycoplasma right and so on but you know just because you have that have those organisms you won't get pneumonia unless there is there are these all these management related uh, failures to support that right so poor colostrum intake poor housing uh, presence of older animals remember when i talked about you know placing the car maybe i have not talked about that yet uh, but you know placing the calf housing away from the adult animals because remember uh, young animals have almost zero immunity right so having old animals in the vicinity doesn't help right because for them uh, something might be a common cell but for because they've already developed immunity but for young animals they've never seen this bacterium the moment it gets exposed to it uh, they become diseased right overcrowding poor feeding poor nutritional status you know all of these have to come together to cause pneumonia same thing for uh, diarrhea also right poor management plus the organisms so the typical bacteria you expect in calf pneumonia is pasteurella and haemophilus uh, viruses would be these right so this is that window of susceptibility that i talked to you about right so like i said you know depending on the textbook you look at depending on the study people have done different parts of the world uh, some books would say this window is four to six weeks some books would say it's uh, six to eight weeks and so on um, so i don't know that will depend on the you know region the management practice uh, the breed of cattle and so on and so forth but what we do know is at some point you know the calf is going to be immune compromised or immune suppressed during this susceptible period of vulnerability or susceptibility so as a farm manager you have to watch out for that uh, the moment you observe that uh, period of vulnerability you take extra precautions right so these where passive immunity goes down gradually right and uh, active immunity doesn't come up like magic so that's why i said you know uh, there's no point vaccinating the newborn calves uh, for diseases that you are going to expect within the first you know two to four weeks of life because it typically takes two to four weeks uh, for immunity to develop right right okay so that's why i remember uh, on the previous morbidity rates i said uh, uh, pneumonia occurrence uh, gets worse after two months uh, th that's because of that okay so why should we care about calf diseases uh, like i said earlier these are not pet animals not because you love the calf so much i don't want to lose the calf i love you so much calf i can't bear the loss of you huh that's that's not the reason uh, that 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 might be five percent of the reason but in a dairy farming uh, industry that is not the major reason the major reason is the economic loss rupees and cents or usd or australian dollars or british pounds or whatever right um, so that is the reason why you care about calf diseases on one aspect right so it's expensive to treat and then uh, and on the other hand like i said you know short term losses and long term losses adds up to this right so it, it adds up to this uh, treatment costs right see uh, cost of treatment for a single affected animal might be this right but then retreatments are included right so there is loss of uh, everything 
gets affected right so then eventually it ends up being an 80 million pound loss to the british dairy industry right so like i said earlier uh, this is not only uh, antimicrobials right so um, uh, you have to control the predisposing factors like you know sanitation colostrum feeding um, so on right and um, then uh, so okay so we, we said five percent two percent one percent for mortality but uh, is it always a reality but if you look at this you'll see uh, you know depending on the breed uh, for this study right uh, depending on the breed they have different uh, rates of mortality or these actually stillbirth uh, up as much as 10 percent stillbirth alone right so you need to know what's early embryonic death what's late embryonic death what's um, abortion what's stillbirth not uh, define those the different causes for those and so on which i have asked in the question section i'm not going to talk about those you have to do your own reference right uh, so anyway but the the basic thing you need to understand here is that um it will depend on the breed it will depend on the management system right etc etc however you need to bring it down to those figures that i talked about you know no less than uh, no more than five percent two percent one percent that's mortality the after birth right but even still birth right so ten percent is unacceptable right uh, now I, I think I might have asked you this question in the past, but I'll ask you again. So this is actually the last slide of the day. So I want you to think of one thing uh, before we conclude. Right now, of course, um, you know, technology has developed, antibiotics have developed, uh, 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 management practices detection diagnostic techniques right uh, all of these have improved significantly from let's say the 1980s to 2000 uh, year 2000 yet look at the rate of stillbirths uh, they have gone up and up right for all all breeds right so swedish holstein red as well as white right this has gone up you know, mostly in uh, this right and then but in in uh, 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 red and white as well right um, so how do you explain this in spite of all the technology developments uh, like diagnostic diagnostic techniques uh, breeding techniques right all that have gone up yet this has become worse how do you explain that think about that uh, we, we will talk about it in the class okay guys that's all for today uh, so next week we'll talk about you know feeding of uh, prevent calves okay so make sure you answer all the questions before coming to the live discussion good luck